Okay, so imagine that you are going to a foreign country. It's quite likely that you don't speak the local language. If you were to go to Madrid, you would have to speak Spanish. In Moscow, you have to speak Russian. And in Tokyo, you have to speak Japanese. However, it's completely socially acceptable if you don't speak the local language, right? Because the people in that local city can empathize with you. They understand the perspective of being an individual in another country not knowing the local language. And so they're still willing to help you out. However, for over one million Americans with aphasia, the local language that they can't speak is their native tongue. And the people who they can't communicate with are their family, their friends, their clinicians, and even their doctors. And while it might appear from the outside that individuals with aphasia have lost cognitive functioning, aphasia is a language disorder that affects expressive and receptive language. So here's an example. Here is a picture and a sample of text that has been generated by, well, the text was generated by an individual with aphasia. The, the picture was not. Um, and as you can see, the text sample ha has difficulty getting their language out. There's words there that are not English. There's pauses. There's stuttering. But if you actually look at what this person is saying, they do understand what's going on in this picture. Unfortunately, many family members, friends, and even doctors find it very difficult to communicate with individuals with aphasia. And because they don't understand this distinction fully, that there's no cognitive damage, they actually dissociate themselves because of this frustration level. And this lack of social bonds greatly impacts quality of life. What's worse is that in many situations, doctors and speech pathologists also lack empathy and understanding about aphasia. And this impacts quality of care. But how do you build empathy? Well, we all know the expression, walk in somebody else's shoes, right? If you can experience the situation yourself, you can empathize with it. Well, if you're trying to empathize with a paraplegic, you may spend a day in a wheelchair going around a city, and you may see some of the challenges that that individual may face on a day-to-day -day basis. But you can't fake a speech disorder, right? You can't put something in front of somebody's mouth and distort their language. So we hypothesized, what if we could build an IM client that could distort text as though it came from aphasia, from an individual who has aphasia? And the important thing to note here is that aphasia affects language that's spoken as well as written. So the first step in this process was for us to conduct a pilot study. We brought in 10 experts on aphasia from psychology and speech and hearing science, and we showed them an early prototype of such an IM system. Now, this was a proof of concept. It was not at all, in any way, shape, or form, an accurate representation of aphasia. But the idea here was to elicit feedback from actual individuals who are experts on aphasia. Where would you use such a piece of software? What are the key features that this software would need to exhibit to be useful for building empathy and understanding? And across the board, we got amazingly positive feedback from these people. They saw applications in both a clinical as well as a classroom setting, and they thought that this could even be used as early as undergrad to start educating people. But the most interesting thing that we heard was how empathy is currently taught to speech pathologists. Right now, what goes on in a classroom setting is we have two speech pathologists who sit in front of one another. One of them is assigned the role of an aphasic, and one of them is assigned the role of a typical individual. And the person who's playing the role of an aphasic has to basically make up what it's like to have aphasia. But these individuals say that this is awkward, often uncomfortable, and inaccurate. Moreover, the individual who's role-playing an aphasic individual is spending most of their time figuring out, how do I emulate someone who has aphasia? So therefore, if we could actually build this IM system, this would be a great improvement over the status quo for this target population. So the next thing we did was we built the Aphasic Characteristic Emulation Software, or ACES. The way ACES works is a user sits down at their computer and, and they see an IM window. And just like if they were having an IM conversation, they would type their message in. However, with ACES, it actually goes into a probabilistic model that's been based off of the literature in psychology and speech and hearing science. This model then distorts the text that the user typed in as though it came from an individual who has aphasia. This distorted message is then sent over the AOL instant message network and is received by a user on the other end. And I want to point out, in this process, nowhere does user one or user two have to role play. They don't have to try to guess how aphasia is supposed to sound or how their language is supposed to be distorted. And the reason is, ACES has 
this configurable probabilistic model. We divided it into five different categories, and I go into great detail, great detail in the paper on how the different errors are generated, the probabilities, and how we manifested the different types of uh, distortions that come with aphasia. I don't really have time to go into it now, but suffice it to say, it's not a Wizard of Oz study. We actually had a real model going on. So the third thing we wanted to do is actually see the impact of such a system like ACES. So we conducted an evaluation. We brought pairs of participants into our lab, and they had an IM conversation with each other. Now, the participants were in separate rooms, and they did not know each other at all. And they never met each other during the entire process. One of them would play the role of an aphasic individual, and one of them would play the role of a typical individual. They would have a conversation, and then they would switch roles. To motivate the conversation, we actually had them have a debate. And we gave them uh, one, co one topic for the first conversation and another topic for the second. Now, our populations consisted of uh, 32 individuals in the control group, which means we said, your text is going to be distorted as though it has aphasia, even though we didn't. And we had 32 participants in the treatment group, which we said, your text is going to be distorted as though, it, as though you have aphasia, and it actually was by ACEs. And the reason we did a control group here is we wanted to see if there was a placebo effect. If simply by saying, your text is going to feel different, does it actually affect their empathy and understanding of aphasia? Now, in addition to the 32-32 split, we also had half of our participants from an informed demographic. These are people who had expertise on aphasia. These are psychologists or speech pathologists. And the other half were from the general population, and the majority of these people never even heard of aphasia before coming into our study. So when we paired our partners up, they all came from the same quadrant in this pundit square, right? So we had control informed having a conversation with controlled informed, just like treatment uninformed had a conversation with someone else from the treatment uninformed group. So here's an IM window that was actually a screenshot taken from our actual study. And as you can see, Apple 36, uh, these are not their real names, um, had their text distorted, and Jet 587 is their conversation partner. And you can see that Jet 587 is dealing with the frustration that comes with this distorted interaction. They're constantly asking for clarification. Sorry, I don't understand what you said. Can you try that again? So at the end of our two conversations, we had participants fill out a questionnaire. And I would like to share some, but clearly not all of our results. So the first question that I would like to discuss is, in hindsight, this experience made me blank empathetic to individuals who have aphasia. And we asked participants to respond on a 1 to 7 Likert scale, where 1 said they felt less empathetic, and 7 said that they felt more empathetic. And as you can see, the control group distribution was generally at 4, no real change, slightly skewing towards 5. And as you can see, the treatment group was very strongly in the 6 group, saying that they really felt that there was a, a change in their empathy towards the individual. And this was highly significant with our 2-way ANOVA. We also asked, in hindsight, how does this experience make you feel for the conversation partner, the person who does not have aphasia, but is communicating with an individual who has aphasia? And we basically see the exact same distribution, and we also see that they are highly significant results. We also wanted to probe as to the application of such a tool as ACEs. And so we asked participants, do you think that this would be useful for building empathy for family members, speech therapists, nurses, doctors, caregivers, etc.? And across the board, we saw significant results. People in the treatment group said that they strongly, they, that they agreed that this would be a useful tool, and participants in the control group said, meh, I guess so, maybe, kind of. And these were all significant. We also asked participants strictly about the knowledge of aphasia. Which condition helped you understand what aphasia was? And we can see at our control group, once again, right down the middle, saying that they didn't feel that one role really informed them uh, one way or another. But we saw in the treatment group that individuals who uh, felt that uh, playing the role of an aphasic was the most influential in understanding what the disorder was. Now here's something really interesting that we observed. We wanted to see, did role matter? Did playing one role improve your empathy more than playing a different role? And once again, we see the control group saying that there was no real difference between playing the role of an aphasic or playing the role in the treatment group. But in the treatment condition, we saw that there was this double hump, right? You can see that there was a bunch of people down at the one or two saying playing the role of an aphasic increased their empathy more. But we also saw a hump at around six or seven, playing the role of a typical individual increased our empathy more. So we said, I wonder if role order mattered. 
So we broke apart the treatment group, aphasic first and typical first. And what we saw is whatever role participants played a second increased their empathy more. So if you played typical than aphasic, you said, oh, playing the role of an aphasic improved my empathy more. If you play the role of aphasic than typical, you said, oh, playing the role of a typical individual helped me be more empathetic. And what's really interesting here is why. Clearly, it could be an order effect. It could also be that having played the role, play, done something first and had a second conversation, you now have context for how to build your empathy. But it also could be the more you use our software, the more empathetic you get. And to study and find out exactly why this is going on, we would need to do more studies. But this is a lot of quantitative feedback. We also ask participants to qualitatively describe how this experience influ influenced empathy and understanding. And for individuals in the informed group, these are the ones who had prior knowledge and experience with aphasia, they thought this was fantastic. They said this was a big improvement over what they saw in the classroom, they learned a lot, and this was a perspective that was just so incredibly useful. But what's really cool is we saw the same thing for the, for the other group, the participants who did not know what aphasia was beforehand. They also said that this was a really great experience, that they learned a lot about the, the challenges that come with communication, communicating with aphasia. And when we tested if there was a difference between the informed and uninformed group quantitatively, we saw that there was no statistical difference. In other words, no matter your background coming into using ACEs, ACEs can improve your empathy and understanding of aphasia. So what we've talked about today is that we brought in experts about, on aphasia, and we, and we showed them a, a, a prototype of our system to get feedback and help guide the design of our final solution. We then built ACEs, an uh, IM client that distorts text based off of a probabilistic model. And this model is grounded in literature in speech and hearing science and psychology. And we then did a user study where we actually saw that ACEs has a highly significant impact on empathy and understanding of aphasia. Now, the goal of this project was not to create an accurate represent, uh, the perfect representation of aphasia. However, in a follow-up study that's right now under submission, we actually did a Turing test type, type examination where we showed participants, experts in speech and hearing science, text that was generated by both our system and text that was actually generated by an actual individual who has aphasia. And the really cool result is they can't tell the difference. So in, a, in effect, this strengthens our results. ACEs creates a realistic representation of aphasia that actually can improve empathy and understanding. And I hope that this project spurs a lot of new research in doing other types of emu empathy emulation systems so that we can look at other disorders and improve the empathy and understanding for family members, friends, and most importantly, doctors and clinicians. I would like to encourage everyone to go to our website, aphasia.es, and the ES is not because we're from Spain, it's because it's dot emulation software. Um, please go there, take a look at uh, the work, that's where we're gonna continue to be publishing these results, and thank you very much for your time.